Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I may welcome you to today's lecture, which is brought to you by the EU Food Star Project, the European Food Star Training Alliance, Food Studies and Training Alliance. My name is Christine Grabler. I will lead you through this afternoon as a moderator. I am located in Vienna and working at LVA. This is an institute for innovation management and uh, innovation development. We are do doing knowledge transfer through vocational training and supporting food industry in Austria for food related research projects. Today I will guide you through this afternoon and start with presenting the agenda. I will give you a short introduction about how to use your control panel. Then I will shortly tell you about the contents of the Foodster project. Then follows the presentation of our today's speaker and give you an, uh, instructions about how to uh, direct your questions to the speaker today. There will be an evaluation by email. Please support us by participating in this email evaluation. So we are now coming to the technical pre-requirements. This is the control panel as you can view it on your screen. First and maybe most important field I will present to you is this text field where you can post your questions. I would invite you to do the questioning in written form in this for field because it's much easier to have the questions written and I can read out them to the lecturer and forward them also so they can read them which is normally more useful and helpful for understanding. This arrow serves for minimizing the panel. Here you can have a choice for a full screen. And this tool allows you to raise your hand virtually. I can see an icon uh, where, uh, which shows me that you raised your hand. I, I can pull my attention towards you and I can then refer to you via the chat. So I will have a written dialogue with attendees who used the raised hand tool. This icon refers to your mic. All attendees micros are muted for obvious reasons because we would have too much background noise. And uh, you may open it and I may open it for questioning, but as I already said, I would prefer written questions because they're usually easier to understand. The session will be recorded and you can get back to it via our project website. This brings me to the Foodster project. European Food Studies and Training Alliance is an Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance project. It started in January 2015 and will be uh, even running longer than December 2017. We will go through March 2018. Gerhard Schleining is the coordinator of this project and I'm talking to you via his communication channel. What is the vision of the EU Food Star project? We see knowledge about food in universities who are transferring this knowledge via the food studies. Food industry also has a lot of knowledge by know-how, by practical applications. The focus in universities is naturally on research, looking on fundamental mechanisms, mechanisms and on publishing scientific findings. Food industry is much more focused on practical applications and is searching for protections of its intellectual property and is also, uh, has also little time to find its solutions. But there is a gap in the two approaches and in collecting the knowledge for in universities and in food industry. And the vision of EU Foodster is 
to close this gap. So Foodstar tries to establish long-term partnerships on European level between academia and industry and tries to offer services with a low threshold so we can involve as many stakeholders as possible. This map shows you the countries that are involved in the Foodstar Consortium. There are seven universities, three food companies and 11 institutes who are providing trainings and doing multiplying services. The universities are located in the Boku in Vienna. This is also the university where the coordinator is from. And the other universities involved are AgroParitech in, in Massy, IPC in Coimbra, UCP in Porto, the University of Hohenheim in Germany, the University of Leeds in the UK, and the University of Teramo in Italy. The food companies involved are Frulact from Portugal, the Spain-based GB Foods, and the Swiss company Nestle is also associated with our project consortium. The 11 multipliers and training providers are closely related to the food industry associations of the respective countries, also LVA. We have also associated partners like the Teachers Network IFA, the Industry Network EFOST and SPES and the student-related network EROICA. The Foodstar centers that we want to establish are not virtual but physical hubs and we try to implement an independent platform which shall sus uh, facilitate sustainable collaborations and link academia and industry successfully. In the frame of your Foodster, we are doing a series of webinars. We would be open for your suggestions. So please send them to us via this email address. It is office at isaki-food.net. Thank you for your attention about the Foodster project. Now it's time to introduce Professor Fatima Puchas. She is our today's speaker. She is an internationally acknowledged expert on packaging, a senior research member of CBQF. She has a lot of teaching experience from the universities at the Faculty of Biotechnology. She is head of the Senate Laboratories and the Food Chemical Lab and has a lot to do with food and chemical and microbiological and packaging analysis. She will share her expertise today with us. And so it's time for me to hand over the screen to you, Fatima. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I am yeah. now handing over the screen to you. You should get a notification in this moment. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for the nice introduction. So, uh, this afternoon, uh, I will be speaking about uh, the packaging technology and preservation of foods. So, the objective is to give uh, an overview on the interaction between the different technologies that are used to preserve the foods and the packaging requirements for uh, those foods. And uh, we will be uh, covering uh, a number of uh, food processing technologies uh, like the frozen foods, dry and dried foods, in thermal, impact thermal processing, a septic processing foods. We will also briefly um, 
discuss modified atmosphere packaging and microwavable foods and finally high pressure processed foods so we will be dealing with what how packaging systems must be when they are intended to these different types of processed foods uh, we will start directly speaking about frozen foods uh, as we well know, and I, I will not certainly go into what is freezing, uh, but I go directly to what are the main causes of degradation in frozen foods. We have dehydration, uh, mainly due to uh, temperature variation during the storage. We may also have oxidation and uh, we may have changes in color and in texture and after the storage process uh, ends we might have loss of vitamins due to exudation okay frozen foods are in fact and that's the reason why i start with this type um, is the process where in fact packaging has uh, the least importance as compared to uh, the other food processing technologies. Even so, uh, so even that I recognize that packaging for frozen foods is not so much important in terms of the final quality as we are uh, dealing with foods that are at very, very low temperature and in fact this very low temperature has the main role on uh, um, <clears throat> conserving the food and preserving the food. Packaging still have importance even in this case. And which are then the packaging requirements? First of all, uh, it's important to have a reduced headspace, though uh, allowing for volume expansion, particularly when the food is packed firstly and then uh, submitted to freezing. Um, this is, um, as we know, uh, water is um, uh, a substance that when uh, freezes uh, suffers from a, a volume expansion. Therefore, um, it is important that the headspace allows for, for this volume expansion. Uh, nevertheless, uh, too high uh, headspace may lead to uh, increased moisture. Um, uh, an increase um, drying of the frozen food surface due to um, temperature oscillation during storage and because of that uh, we are all recommended not to buy, not to consume uh, a food packaging where we can see from inside too much ice loose in the pack that means that um, probably there was temperature abuse and which related to the headspace can give ways to moisture decrease to drying uh, of the product surface. So reduced headspace still allowed for some expansion so the right size of the headspace is a requirement for packaging for frozen food. Um, we uh, need also the adequate moisture barrier and in many products uh, light and oxygen barrier are also required to avoid um, to avoid loss of uh, texture, to avoid loss of um, um, pigments, color changes uh, that are also important, particularly when the product is going to be cooked and uh, consumed. 
Another very important uh, requirement for the packaging is the mechanical resistance. As we all know, um, frozen food, frozen, frozen products are very hard. Um, very often we have fish, we have um, spines, we have bones. So uh, tearing and perforation is uh, common. And the, the material the packaging is made of should uh, comply with this mechanical resistance. Um, after the, the storage period, the, the food is going to be prepared, cooked and consumed. Uh, and that depends a lot on how uh, it's going to be. There are a variety, uh, enormous variety uh, of situations. In all cases though, it's important that the packaging does not stick to the food when we are trying to remove the food from inside the packaging when uh, uh, before cooking. That in many cases requires spe special additives when we are using pulling pulley packaging. Furthermore, uh, fat and water uh, impermeable. Um, as we don't want the packaging to drip off all over uh, while it's uh, removed from the freezer uh, in order to uh, prepare the food. More and more, a frozen food is associated to um, the, uh, the, the process that is going to be used to uh, actually prepare uh, the, the, the food or the meal. Uh, which can be uh, a oven, a microwave, or, or boiling. And depending on uh, this uh, type of uh, further processing, the packaging should also comply with the, with the requirements for that application. So here are some examples of uh, packaging used for frozen foods. Um, we have uh, basically three different types. Flexible packaging used as a primary packaging. Uh, and uh, here we can see, um, uh, for example, these packages uh, where we have the, the printing uh, on, on, the, on the pouch. And here it's common to, to use uh, polyethylene bags, modified polypropylene bags or multi-layer plastics with metallized bags, uh, depending on the shelf life that uh, uh, is required. We can also use um, a folding carton, like in this uh, situation, uh, with a non-printed inner bag, which I show here in the top uh, slide. Uh, in some cases, a folding carton can be also used as a primary packaging. And here we need a carton coated with a polyethylene to improve the resistance uh, of the board to, to moisture uh, and to the fat from the food. Um, we can now move uh, and speak about dry and dried foods requirements for packaging. In this case, um, the main causes uh, of degradation uh, are the increase in moisture, which can lead to change in the texture, microbial development, and in fa to fat oxidation. We have here uh, this uh, very well-known uh, picture that represents the influence of water activity in the relative reaction rates of different different types of reactions and we have here the curve in bold um, showing the moisture sorption isotherms. <clears throat> we can see uh, also here uh, the, the rate of the particular uh, reaction rate which is the lipid oxidation. And we can see that the rate of lipid oxidation increases, is, is higher at medium to high water activities. Uh, then we have a, a lower rate at intermediate water activities, around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, but at very, very low 
um, water activities, we may have for certain products again an increase in the oxidation, lipid oxidation rate. So that, that means uh, that um, uh, dry and, and dried foods, depending on the water activity, which is also related to the moisture content, uh, they are submitted, su suggested to uh, different rates of oxidation. So even products with uh, a lower fat content, like or relatively low fat content, like breakfast cereals, for example, may in fact um, suffer from uh, fat oxidation with enormous impact in off flavor. So the packaging requirements for these dry and dried foods are, first of all, moisture barrier, and in some cases, light oxygen barrier, particularly for the higher fatty products. Uh, in these products, it's very important also to have very low oxygen residual content. And for those products, that means that sometimes it's not enough to have a low oxygen barrier to the packaging, but we, knew we need to um, evacuate, eliminate the uh, residual uh, oxygen inside the packaging by either doing vacuum, by flushing uh, the packaging with an earth uh, atmosphere, or using uh, absorbers, uh, oxygen absorbers. In this case, um, and in often, it's also important for this type of products to have a packaging system that allows to closuring between his uses to avoid moisture increase when the, the product is not consumed all at the first instance. So, uh, which are the types of packaging that typically we can use and see in the market for dry and dried foods? Well, we have uh, those materials that are high barrier to moisture, like the polyolefins, polyethylene, low density polyethylene, or the oriented polypropylene, or the metallized uh, polypropylene. Uh, when the case is, comes that high barrier to oxygen is also required, we need to use typically multi-layer materials combining uh, AVOH or aluminum foil to provide uh, the, the barrier to oxygen and these materials are uh, combined with uh, these ones. Uh, the third case is when parallel to barrier to oxygen and to moisture we also need to have good barrier to light. Okay, uh, we mo in most cases need to use a combination, uh, a multi-layer material including an aluminum foil, which provides not only for the oxygen barrier, but also to the light barrier. Or we may use uh, a system that is not opaque to light, combined with a folding carton uh, that provides um, opacity. In this uh, picture here, we can see uh, the oxygen um, permeability of several materials uh, in this uh, direction. And on the right side, we can see uh, the values for permeability to um, water vapor, uh, it uh, also applied to uh, different uh, materials. So this can be used as a guide for which materials we may use or we need to combine 
in order to have a global um, global performance uh, of um, the packaging for for my product. We can also move into uh, impact processed foods. And here we will be dealing with mostly canned food. Of course, we may have uh, foods thermally processed in other materials uh, like glass and multi-layer composite materials. But I will speak just now about metal cans. We are all uh, aware that the main principles for uh, impact thermal processing is uh, we it process the food after having filling the can and closing. Uh, we submit the close fill closed can to a specified process temperature and time in order to inactivate or kill microorganisms and to inactivate enzymes. With this treatment, we obtain a commercial stability, uh, a product with a long shelf life at room temperature of storage. Uh, which are then the packaging requirements for these products? Well, first of all, of course, having a metal can, the geometry and the size of the metal can will influence greatly the heat conduction and the temperature that is achieved in the center of the food product. But I will not expand on that, though. We need, uh, from the packaging point of view, we need to have a metal can system that resists to the heat. In this metallic system, we have uh, the metal can itself that is produced in tin plate or in aluminum, typically, but we also have the internal coating. And is with this one that we need to take care in order to have an internal coating that is resistant to the thermal treatment that is going to be applied to my product. We have different uh, heat treatments according to the uh, food products that is going to be processed. And because of that, we have different uh, internal coatings, such as the epoxy phenolic, which has this golden color that we see in many, many food cans. And we may also have a polyester coating. So we have different coatings according to the requirements of protection of my food and also according to the heat treatment that my can is going to be submitted to. We also need the metal can to resist to uh, dimensions, the dimensional variation that occurs during the heat treatment. Starting that uh, during the, uh, this treatment, we have increase of internal pressure, we have volume expansion. So we need to have in the can some features to work as valves escaping, to expansion escaping, uh, in order to protect the double seam from irreversible dimensional changes. So we have on the top and, and, and in many cases in, in the bottom hand, we have what we call the expansion panel uh, that are the rings uh, uh, inserted in the, in the hand, in the can hand, to allow for volume expansion. On the other hand, uh, 
approaching the end of the heat treat treatment, we have vacuum forming upon on the cooling stage of the processing. And in this case, uh, the, the metal can must be mechanically re resistant to avoid paneling, buckling, and when this vacuum is formed inside the can. And this is uh, because we have, in many cases, this wall of the can with some rings that increase the resistance to this vacuum uh, inside the can uh, upon cooling. So, uh, the design uh, of the metal can must be optimized according to the its treatment uh, that the food is going to so, to be submitted to. Still in, in this uh, impact thermal processing, we very important is to uh, prevent recontamination after the process cooling. So we need to have a uh, hermetic uh, can, we need to have a very, very tight double seam. So double seam is uh, how the hand is closing uh, the can body. And here we can, we, we can see uh, a cross-section projection of uh, a double seam uh, and all these parameters should be measured and, con in, and controlled during the um, regular quality control of a plant running uh, canned food. Moving now to the aseptic processed foods. Here the concept is different. Uh, <clears throat> we heat treat the food and the packaging as separated operations. And then we fill and close the packaging under aseptic conditions. We have, a res as a result, uh, a product that is uh, uh, also stable uh, under normal, non-refrigerated conditions uh, um, with, without uh, viable uh, microorganisms. But in this case, however, uh, we may use ultra-high temperature uh, for a, a short period uh, of um, of time uh, as compared to uh, a lower maximum temperature for a higher um, duration periods of treatment. Uh, because uh, the materials uh, are not um, treated, that the packaging materials are not submitted to the same treatment that the food is, in this case we can use packaging materials that do not need to be resistant to high temperature. Um, while uh, in the previous case, as you remember, in the metal cans, in the impact treatment, we needed to use mat uh, materials uh, temperature resistant. So in this case, we don't need to use those materials. Uh, we need to use uh, materials that are suitable for the sterilization process and we will see that the sterilization process is may be done by other means than, than heat. We need to have good, uh, good seals to have uh, a, a hermetic packaging because we will have again long uh, shelf life and these good seals uh, should also allow, uh, together with the material, to a packaging that is barrier to gas, aroma and, and light. 
So typically, uh, uh, we use materials that are uh, combining uh, plastic, uh, paper and aluminum foil, as it is here indicated in this picture. We may also have uh, basically two types of systems. Systems that are uh, where the material is supplied in coil and then we have a machine that forms, fill and seal the packaging in, 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 a, in, in a single uh, machine. We have also other systems where the packages are supplied as pre-formed pre with um, the, each individual packaging already cut and then the filling is done packaging by packaging. So we have basically these two different systems, form, fill, seal and preformed packs. We might have different uh, means for packaging sterilization. Although we, don't, we do not need necessarily to use heat or high temperature like vapor or hot air, uh, still this may also be applied in some cases. We may also sterilize the packaging material taking advantage of the heat energy from the processing of the plastic or the material itself. In most cases, however, in the market today, we use um, hydrogen peroxide and uh, in some cases combined with radiation, ultraviolet, infrared or gamma radiation. Just a brief introduction that the sterilization degree, so the efficiency uh, that we get in sterilizing our packaging material depends on the initial contamination, on the type uh, in the pack and, and the shape uh, of our packaging and of course our, uh, on the intrinsic uh, treatment efficiency. Very often we use combination of techniques like I mentioned the hydrogen peroxide with UV light for example is a very typical um, case uh, of a mean to, to uh, sterilize aseptic packaging. Here are some uh, examples of commercial um, cartons uh, packaging uh, aseptic. In this case from Tetra Pak, uh, we have different uh, systems, the Tetra Big, Tetra Classic, Tetra Vero, um, sorry, Tetra Vero is this one, Tetra Fino, so we will have all in, in the screen some examples of uh, Tetra Pak systems that are form, fill, seal systems. We have here some examples as well of um, aseptic systems from Combi Block, another company that supplies um, pre-formed uh, packages um, and we have here the Combi Fit, uh, the Combi Block and, and the Combi, Combi Dome. So these are a few <laughs> examples of commercially available uh, packages that we can see in our supermarkets. So moving now into modified Lucia packaging, this is a very complex. Um, we know that for uh, when we speak about modified Lucia packaging, we mean uh, the use of uh, an atmosphere with a composition different from, from that from normal air. Uh, which we know uh, which is uh, basically nitrogen and, and oxygen um, and this uh, technology has uh, a lot of applications uh, meat, fish, pasta, cheese, 
dried also uh, vegetables and fruits. So it's, it's becoming and it's very common in some uh, markets. Uh, the gases used are the same uh, oxygen uh, if we want to uh, decrease the, the level in order to prevent oxidation or growth of microaerobic uh, uh, microorganisms. We still need to have some oxygen inside the packaging. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, red fresh meat. Uh, we still need some oxygen inside to uh, uh, allow for uh, the respiration of fruits and vegetables and to avoid an aerobic growth in other uh, cases. Oxy carbon dioxide uh, is important to avoid the growth of aerobic bacteria and, and molds. Um, and if we have a, a, a high fatty food, carbon dioxide can be uh, absorbed uh, by, the, by the fatty food and this in excess can yield bad taste, uh, exudation and, and packaging collapse. So uh, in these cases nitrogen is uh, an inert gas is used basically as a balance and to avoid collapse in the case where carbon dioxide can be uh, can be absorbed in, in excess uh, by the food. So these are the three typical gases, although more and more other gases are being studied, uh, but uh, like the argon for example. Uh, so the critical parameters uh, for a packaging to uh, modify atmosphere packaging are uh, the product, the initial quality and the, the nature of, uh, of the product. Depending on if it is a non-respiring um, uh, parameters like water activity and fat content are very important. If we have a respiring product, the species, the type and the maturation grade of this product are, are key uh, aspects. We need to optimize uh, the composition of the mixture and we need also to have a very good control of temperature in order to uh, maximize the efficiency of our system. Uh, the equipment efficiency as well, so the equipment used to inject the mixer or to do the mixer and inject the mixer are uh, also very important in order to have a successful uh, modified atmosphere packaging. The packaging characteristics itself are of course uh, the barrier properties for uh, barrier to the different gases not only in absolute value but also uh, the ratio between uh, the uh, permeability to carbon dioxide and, uh, and oxygen. The way uh, uh, the, this, this ratio and these uh, permeabilities change with temperature is also a key aspect to be considered in, in packaging uh, for uh, MAP. Here we have some uh, recommended atmospheres uh, for different products. Um, for example, for cheese, depending on if we have a hard cheese or a soft cheese, we may allow to have higher content, higher percentage of uh, carbon dioxide um, in the hard cheese while in the soft cheese we cannot allow such an amount due to the problems of collapsing that I mentioned and therefore we need to have balance with nitrogen. In this picture we can see some um, recommended atmospheres for uh, different products, uh, vegetables and, and fruits and where we have 
a window of a range of oxygen and a range of CO2 concentrations for each product. For example, in this case for strawberry, we allow 5% uh, to 10% oxygen and 15% uh, to 20% of oxygen. Uh, we can see here uh, a black line which indicates it's a, it's a line with um, represented by the equation that you can see in the bottom of the slide um, with a, a slope that is the inverse of beta, the ratio of uh, CO2 permeability to oxygen permeability. And we may use the uh, we, we may use a specific material for a certain product when uh, the line that I draw with the slope as the inverse of beta uh, intersects uh, the area where my product is located. For example, in this case shown in the slide, we may use the film material that corresponds to this uh, to this line for mushrooms and for uh, cantaloupe melon, but not for strawberries, not for spinach. A few examples of packaging used for MAP. Uh, in this case, for meat and fish, we have trays uh, made in polystyrene, expanded polystyrene. Then with AVOH to have a high barrier. Uh, we may also have trays uh, not, yeah, that are not high barrier and then have a bag that uh, a pouch or a bag outside that are uh, good, that is a good barrier. Uh, for fruits and vegetables here, we have several types of films like the polyethylene, polypropylene. We have mixtures uh, with vinyl, ethylene vinyl estate. Um, we have often a combination of different copolymers and, and laminated. Uh, more and more, uh, there have been developments on uh, micro perforation uh, and microporous films with tailor made uh, perforations towards the respiring needs uh, of the um, of the products. I would like now to speak a little bit about uh, the packaging for foods that are going to be uh, processed, heated, uh, prepared in the microwave. As we all know, uh, the heating process in, in a microwave is completely different from that uh, uh, occurring in, in a conventional, uh, conventional oven. So the packaging material uh, may also be and must be different. In this case, uh, in the microwave, as we all know, we did, do not set a certain specific temperature. We specify a time and we specify um, a power of, of our oven. So uh, the temperature that is going to be um, achieved is going to depend on the, the amount of energy absorbed. Uh, and this depends on the mass, on the composition, uh, shape and thickness of the food. It also depends on the thermal properties of the food itself, namely the conductivity and the heat capacity. So this means that the temperature that is achieved in my product and the temperature that my packaging is going to be submitted to depends on the product that is uh, put there. 
So I, I cannot say for a certain packaging material, packaging system, if it is, a, 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 is, if it is usable or not in a microwave unless I also define what are the foods, what is the food that uh, I'm going to use the packaging to. We need to take care of uh, shape and size um, of the packaging. It should be regular as much as possible to avoid sharp corners, rounds and ovals instead of squared. Packaging should have a bottom concave for lower thickness of the food at the center and all this promotes uh, the better uh, distribution of the heat. We also may use lids to increase temperature uniformization. The type of material uh, must be microwave transparent, but although the material is not likely to uh, warm up due to the microwaves itself, the material is going to warm up due to the contact with the food that is going to be heated. Therefore, I also need some thermal resistance of the for the material. And here are a few examples of uh, uh, trays that can be, for example, in a uh, board coated with, poly uh, with uh, polyester or um, trays in um, polyester uh, crystallized or uh, in, in polypropylene. And we also have more recent systems that allow for specific roles and specific heat eating. Like in this case, we have uh, two compartment packaging where the, there are specific perforations to allow for vapor to be removed um, in a tailor-made uh, situation to cook differently the vegetable portion compared to the protein portion, the, the, the meat uh, that is located in a, the different uh, compartments. Finally, we will discuss briefly the, high pre the packaging for high pressure processed foods. So, high pressure processed, the HPP, HPP, also known as high hydrostatic pressure processing or ultra high pressure processing, involves the use of pressures in the range of 100 to 800 megapascal and can be combined with application of heat to inactivate uh, different pathogenic and spoilage uh, bacteria and, and other microorganisms. Uh, as I referred, it can be sometimes combined with uh, thermal treatment, uh, as in the example I show here, where we have in the blue the, the, the history of uh, pressure um, treatment and at red uh, the, the temperature uh, profile. So uh, this this process has uh, some uh, advantages and some limitations as all the the other processes and, and processing te technologies that we have uh, seen um, before. Um, just to say that we have a, a very rapid, um, quasi-instantaneous uh, distribution uh, of the pressure throughout the sample uh, and this is suitable for liquid and pumpable foods um, and it has been perceived uh, by consumer as a feed process and with uh, uh, highly um, sensorial properties. So it has been a highly uh, acceptable acceptance from uh, consumer aspects. Uh, important 
parameters to consider uh, for the packaging. First, volume and geometry. Although uh, this process and these parameters are not important for the process, itself, uh, for the efficiency of, of the treatment itself, but it's important for the productivity uh, of the process. Um, and therefore, there are some shapes that are um, uh, designed to allow for uh, higher uh, capability, higher throughput uh, of the processes. The composition uh, of the material, uh, the polymer type, the thickness and sealing and very important properties are very important uh, considerations for the packaging. And at least one interface of the packaging should be flexible in order to allow for pressure to be transmitted all over. Uh, we need also a packaging with uh, reduced head space, with reduced air, particularly reduced oxygen uh, content in the, in, the, in the head space. Because dissolved oxygen becomes very reactive at high pressure, and also because air uh, compresses uh, differently uh, compared to, to water and much more effort is needed to compress the hair. So we should avoid, uh, we cannot have he uh, high uh, head space and uh, a lot of air or oxygen in the, in the head space uh, of the packaging. These are examples of uh, packages that we can see on the market for, for this uh, type of products. Uh, another uh, requirement is the resistance to the treatment. Uh, we know that uh, physical changes in the structure of the polymers, for example, that are typically used, uh, may occur. And I show you we, here um, two, uh, several pictures uh, from, collected from the bibliography. And we can see in this case um, the lamination, um, that's the separation of the different layers of a material. And we have here some flex crack of uh, um, aluminum foil um, from PET uh, laminate, which can compromise the barrier properties after uh, the treatment. The treatment may also have an impact of migration on, on food com uh, component, on packaging components into food. And therefore, it's uh, very important to take care of uh, uh, the resistance of the material to the, to the process, not only during the process, but on, also on the changes in, in, in the material that can compromise the performance of the packaging system during storage after the treatment. So as a final conclusion, I hope that I have gave, gave uh, uh, an overview of uh, how complex packaging can be or specific packaging can be. Uh, as the packaging requirements, they change considerably with the technology used to preserve the food and this should be considered together in the food process design. Thank you for your attention. Thank you too for your lecture, Fatima. I think it was a very comprehensive one. We had a lot of information conveyed now this last 40 minutes. So thank you very much. I'm just uh, having a look at the attendees list. And I have a question here from Ms. Georgiadou. Is there any difference in packaging requirements in the case of dried and dried oven food, e.g. nuts that are initially dried and then heated in an oven and then, and then packed? 
Thank you very much for that question. I think it's a very good question. Uh, from my experience, uh, I may say that when we have a dried in an oven food uh, product, uh, it, at the end of the process, the, the food is highly, highly hygroscopic. So, very important uh, in this case is uh, how to cool down the product before packaging, before inserting it in the packaging. In both cases, on the dry and or the dried in the oven, the requirements may be the same, but I tend to say that when we have a dried in the oven product, you need a better barrier to moisture. But most, more important than that is that you need to take care at the end of the oven, how do you allow the product to uh, cool down before packing it? Because in, in some cases, we can see that if not proper care is taken, when, you, when the food or the product is going to be packed, it has already gained some. This is a very common mistake unfortunately, that I see in, in, some, in some industries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fatima. I have a question which is rather concerning maybe the Austrian market. We see that high pressure uh, appliance is only uh, legally possible for food uh, products that from meat, so for sausages and meat products. What do you think? What is the development looking like for the future for high pressure application? Well, uh, I don't have, um, let's say, specific information uh, regarding that, uh, I'm afraid. But from which I see as a consumer and uh, I, in, in other markets, I think that this is um, a process that has been gaining and will continue to gain interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Fatima. I have no further question. I think, no, one moment, please. Are they always packed? The, ah, there's a question from Mrs. Piazzotta or Platotta. My question is about high pressure products. Are they always packed before treatment? And so the packaging undergoes pressure treatment as well. Or a septic filling is used too. So the question is if high pressure is applied to only packed products. That I know always is applied after packaging, yes. To my knowledge, yes. Okay. Another question from Mr. Ververis. Migration of substances from packaging material to food, on which parameters does it depend? The migration of substances from the packaging material to the food. Okay. Um, the migration depends on um, on the migrant, first of all, which mm -hmm. is the substance that is migrating. It depends on the type of food, if it is like the chemical nature of the food, like if it is more aqueous or more fatty, or how is the pH, for example. So the, the chemical nature of the food also plays an important role. And uh, the other uh, parameter or that influences a lot migration is the temperature and the time. So the longer the time, the higher the temperature, the higher the migration. 
So in this case, it's like that we have been discussing some processing, food processing uh, techniques where we use high temperature as the processing food. Uh, this is the step where most likely more contributes to the migration because although for some minutes or, 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 or hour fraction, mm -hmm. uh, the temperature is very high uh -huh. as compared yeah. to storage time at room temperature. So we have long storage time but at room temperature for example. Mm -hmm. So basically to summarize, migration depends on the migrant itself, on the food it's going migrating into, temperature and time. Yeah, thank you Fatima. As far as I can see there are no further questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fatima, for your very interesting lecture. It was really a comprehensive one with a lot of information. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank we you. will <laughs> we will share with you the recording of this event and also the presentation that you showed us today via the project website. You can find it under events and webinars. There's the whole list of webinars that were already held and those that are planned. So you are cordially invited to come back to our website and refer to the recordings and get back to the material of the lectures. Thank you to the audience for your attention. Thank you Fatima again for your lecture and I wish you all a good evening and a nice afternoon wherever you are. Goodbye from Vienna.